David Bonson, CIO of the Bonson Group. Before that, he spent a bunch of time at Morgan Stanley and then at UBS uh, uh, running money here. So, Under Sergio Armati. Exactly. Uh, now, uh, interesting, Mr. Armani's back. Uh, David, thanks so much for joining us here. Um, what are you telling your clients these days? You know, it just January was great. Fe February, not so much. March, just kind of hanging out here. And now we start quarter two. What are you telling your clients? Well, essentially, I'm telling them exactly what markets are telling us, which is that there's a lot of uncertainty in the equity market and that that volatility is likely to continue. I'm struck by Bullard's comment about the um, equity volatility uh, can mean certain things at different times for financial conditions, and it's just not really their job to look at it because I very much agree with them. It is not their job to look at that. Uh, financial conditions are going to move for any number of different reasons, and their job is to not be taking their signals that way. Rather, um, it is quite evident that the disinflation is upon us and that they have over-tightened and uh, they seem hell-bent on uh, exacerbating the mistakes they make on both ends, uh, staying too low too long and then staying too tight too long. Well, don't they – I mean, it seems what they really want to do is avoid the fate of Arthur Burns. They, they don't want to um, uh, you know, shoot before they see the whites of the eyes of, I guess, uh, disinflation, right? Well, I would love to believe that they cared about that. I don't. I definitely understand rhetorically that Powell has talked much more that way, more Volcker-like than Burns-like. But uh, Arthur Burns never had the luxury of dealing with M2 dropping 3% in one quarter. And uh, the CPI lag essentially representing over half, uh, the shelter lag rather, in CPI, representing over half of what we see in CPI. Um, Burns was not coming off of a shutdown of the economy that then led to a supply side, really a debacle in the production of goods and services, labor shortages, other things like that. And so there were a lot of differences in the inflation of the 70s and the inflation we've had of the last 18 months. But but what, do you, way, what do you think then, David? Uh, it's been suggested to us by, I think, Daniel Martino Booth that part of what Powell wants to do is just break the Fed put – for now and forever. What, what do you think his end game is? Yeah, and, and I, I love Danielle, and I think that Danielle's assessment of what Powell did back in 18 and 19 was some of the best out there, but I don't agree with her uh, that that is the case. I don't think any Fed chair can break the Fed put. I think that it is not merely a matter that Wall Street or Main Street has gotten dependent on it, both of which is true, but um, the U.S. economy has gotten dependent on it. The pension funds... Uh, the unfunded liabilities of pensioners all around the country um, to totally break the put if we really thought that was happening. Credit spreads would be 500 basis points wider than they are. Uh, we had a year last year where everyone was talking about recession, and yet duration underperformed credit. I mean, it was it's surreal that we're having a banking moment right now, and there isn't a single lick of credit impairment. It's entirely interest rate risk. So I don't think that the Fed put is going anywhere. But again, even if Daniel's right, we wouldn't know it until they really get tested. I mean, the S&P is down 20. Uh, the Nasdaq was in, uh, from last year. The Nasdaq had already gone up 50 before it came down 30. Credit spreads are still really, really tame. Nothing has broken yet. Now we have the banking system. Uh, you know, I certainly think the Fed can control housing price inflation with the interest rate. And, and that bubble is out of control. So that's one element where I believe they can control inflation. I just don't believe they have any control with the Fed funds rate over mm -hmm. normal goods and services. All right, Dave, let's get to brass tacks here. Uh, where do we go with our money? A lot of folks are telling me to go to quality. I'm not really sure what that means, but it feels like I should be buying companies that sell toothpaste and they mean cash shampoo flow, right? and, and have high dividends. I mean, is, how do you think about quality in today's market? What does that mean to you? Yeah, so I can only assume that you're teeing me up accidentally. I certainly am talking my book here, but uh, the difference is I'm not making a tactical call for quality. It's all we do. It's all we ever believe in. We never want to be buying uh, high-priced, high-multiple. What do you mean, David, issues. when you say quality? We mean balance sheet strength and free cash flow, and that's all anyone should mean. I mean, I would add to that, although I think it's sort of implied, 
a business model that is sensible and defensible and so forth. But out of that business model that is not quite so cyclical and not quite so speculative, quality is a financial condition. It refers to balance sheet strength, lower debt ratios, and more predictable and growing free cash flow. And how do we know if a company has dependable dividend growth? It's from the free cash flow growth. You can't pay a dividend for money that doesn't exist. And so as dividend growth managers, uh, a little over $2.5 billion of the over $4 billion that I manage is in dividend growth equity, and it is doing extremely well right now. Uh, and we believe it's the right place to be going forward. But again, we believe that even when Fang is rallying. But hey, while you're talking your book, you want to give us some names? <laughs> yeah, by the way, I think a name like Blackstone and Apollo, which are a couple asset managers, they get lumped in with financials, and we know the banks have had a hard time. But these are just unbelievable dividend growers that simply don't have a bank business model at all. They don't take balance sheet risk. They're using investor money from which they get really good fees, really good promotes, and they're mostly in non-traditional asset classes, private equity, hedge funds, real estate, credit, um, and they're asset gathering machines. And so Blackstone and Apollo are two robust dividend growing names. Blackstone we've owned for a decade and uh, believe that they will continue growing the dividend in high single digits per year. You're going to get about a 5% dividend annualized, and you're going to get, we think, that much or more in price growth. How about energy? Um, I'm thinking, David, I might have missed that whole train there, that whole boat. What happened with energy? Is there anything left there? Yeah, there certainly is, although we are a little bit more bullish now on midstream than upstream. But, you know, when you say missed the boat, if you mean the uh, 45% move in yeah, that might be it. <laughs> and the 60% move last year. But you know what? Um, it's trading at 9.2 times earnings. Okay, It's trading at half of its annualized uh, valuation. Meanwhile, tech, which was pummeled last year, is still trading at 24 times versus an 18 times historical. So I, I would still argue that energy is undervalued relative and tech is overvalued relative. But uh, a better place to be from a quality standpoint is midstream. Really robust free cash flow growth, heavy dividend coverage, and they really delevered. What is they midstream? Is, is that refineries? Um, no, refineries would be more downstream, and re midstream would be the pipelines and ah. storage, transportation. It's a very environmentally friendly play as well. You don't want oil and gas being transported by truck and by rail. And so we like the pipeline space. And then, of course, the LNG export story yep. is a midstream story, too. And we think there's huge growth potential there. If I, if I wanted to build a new pipeline today, I couldn't get it done, could Not I? Not in this administration. Why did we all hate that uh, big pipeline coming down know. from Canada? I don't know. Some of the elk migration yeah. or something. So, but it, I mean, it, I mean, that's also kind of a bullish part of the the midstream call. They're not going to be adding more pipelines. Yeah, I do hope that that will change. I believe it is, uh, uh, without getting overly political, an incredibly foolish decision by the current administration. But the fact of the matter is, you're right. It boosts up the value of incumbent assets yep. when you artificially constrain new supply. All right. We'll have to see how that plays out. David Bonson, always a pleasure to chat with, get some good ideas. David Bonson, CIO of the Bonson Group. He's been managing private wealth money for a long time. He's got a lot of perspective. He's out there on the West Coast, too, which we like out there in Newport Beach, California. God, that's got to be tough going to the I office mean, every day. You're listening to The Tape.